This is Ground Zero Television, and we're speaking with Professor Emmanuel Ness of Brooklyn College, New York, uh, New York City University of New York, City University of New York, CUNY, mm -hmm. and this is December uh, 21. 21. Christmas is right around the corner; is right up the street. The midterm elections was uh, over a month ago, and Ground Zero Television would like to to get. Um, Professor Ness's opinions about the midterm elections. Um, we heard a lot about the Tea Party and um, how much a, a, a factor it was in the midterm elections. Um, how much of a, a factor do you think that the Tea Party played in the uh, meltdown of the Democratic Party during the midterm elections? I think that uh, you can call me Manny. Yes. Um, Okay. Uh, I think the Tea Party was very important in mobilizing uh, working class and right wing support for policies that are anti working class. That uh, they mobilized a white working class in the United States because the Democratic Party has been feeble in that effort. So uh, the Tea Party, which seemed to have come out of the blue, uh, has gained a tremendous amount of traction in the last. Uh, two years or so uh, to become influential. So I would see them more of a mobilizing force than actually a organized uh, opposition. However, with the caveat that they, they have um, some very clear policies, a number of people admittedly uh, have fascist perspectives uh, that are related to Glenn Beck. Uh, and Sarah Palin and so forth of uh, what it means to be an American and uh, I think one has to f agree with whatever they say to be a part of that uh, rubric. So I think uh, their influence in the party w uh, in the elections were a, a mobilizing force. Uh, on the, some people might say that they hurt the Republicans uh, because they did not get the mainstream corporate types uh, in the primaries elected or to be their candidates who might have also defeated Democrats. So one might argue perhaps that the, and some have argued, many have argued that the Republicans might have done better even without the Tea Party. However, I think given the fact that they're in government or will be in government, many of them, uh, the, they are a dangerous force and if their ideas gain traction, I see a potential threat to uh, the number of uh, groups in American society uh, with respect to their views, if their views are taken up wi in a widespread fashion. I think a lot of us were laughing and joking about their abilities and their, their ideas. As you, you think that the uh, progressives underestimated the Tea yes, Party? Yes, I do. I, I think they underestimated their, the fa the, I, I think there was a sense that a lot of people in the last two years thought that we were in a post-political uh, era, so to speak, that uh, politics doesn't matter. And I think that um, you know, you're mentioning uh, the notion of uh, the president and so forth, of uh, alliances and so forth. And I, I think the right wing wants to be the right wing, and they, we really don't have anybody on the left uh, to represent left wing or worker or working class people. And so the Tea Party was successful in mobilizing the working class in the general election, so I would say, and, and also the primaries. Okay, speaking of the president, um, how much of this um, midterm fiasco can we attribute it to President Obama? Um, well, you know, a lot of people say the fiasco wasn't as bad as it really looks because uh, Obama picked up a lot of, uh, helped a lot of Democrats in Republican districts traditionally in the House and that those seats were mostly completely lost uh, and more and that you know one can expect in midterm elections to have a uh, 
uh, the party in power, especially if you're holding the House and the uh, Senate and the presidency, to lose seats, uh, but they lost a record number of seats, over 60 seats in the House. So um, I would say that the lack of a focus with respect to Obama led to some of these losses. The clear message that was not sent, no clear message was sent in um, opposition to a number of policies that were put forward uh, by Republicans. Uh, no clear messages were sent in favor of a workers, working class uh, uh, majority in this country, which you know, many we all argue that there is a working class majority. But uh, Obama seemed to have satisfied the Republicans and uh, proven once again that, uh, in fact, the Democrats and the Republicans are really one party in some cases with uh, two heads, so to speak. So that uh, Obama was probably the epitome of it since he wanted to reach out to Republicans. So if you're going to reach out to Republicans in a government where the parties are, in my view, not polarized ideologically, but polarized politically. And by that I mean that uh, ideologically they, they share the same view of supporting the capitalist class in this country. Um, if you're going to reach out to uh, those people, and I suppose those are the only people really that Obama seems to have uh, sought uh, after, um, and he did pass the health care bill, which was extremely watered down and so forth uh, to begin with. Uh, and uh, there were a couple of other policies that were, I would argue, too little and too late. Um, and so he, his base, I think, shifted as well uh, away from the working class. And they don't even want to call them the working class. They call them the middle class. If you listen to the rhetoric, them uh, is the majority of Americans. So you feel uh, that um, he, he alienated um, his base, progressive Democrat, because of his compromises on many things like health care, like the uh, public uh, option and um, cap and trade, and among uh, some other things that, um, mm -hmm. you know, if you look at um, the uh, statistics of the, uh, the election, um, his, the young voters didn't come out. Mm -hmm. um, even um, Black people did not go to the polls like they did in 2008. Some people say, well, that's expected in the midterm, but um, you don't feel that he mobilized his left base? They were, you feel that they were disappointed? Um, I, when you say progressive uh, base, uh, I think that he probably alienated a lot of members of that uh, part uh, that actually was extremely enthusiastic about the Obama victory that uh, I think falsely were enthusiastically expecting him to come in and to provide all these amazing uh, new programs and that we would you know reach a new uh, level in this country of uh, uh, unity and uh, unity around uh, liberal progressive ideas. Those people who thought he would do that I think he's alienated but he never really said he was going to do that. He said he was going to reach out to the Republican Party, or he was going to reach out to independents and the Republican Party. And so I think we should not be so surprised, uh, you and I, I'm sure, probably feel that way, about the policies. I mean, in some cases, I think he's gone very far to coddle the right wing in this country with respect to the tax cuts and so forth that are extended. But I would say that he has alienated those people that worked for him, and they were progressives, those people who worked extremely hard to get him elected. Um, and uh, yet at the same time, the movement seemed, to, we were talking about the uh, Tea Party, the movement seemed to turn to the right because there wasn't really any left alternative. The progressives were hoping the president would do something about all these policies uh, without necessarily mobilizing uh, working class people, um, and you are correct to uh, note that people, young people, uh, African Americans, Latinos, to uh, an extent have not come out and did not come out to support him uh, in the numbers that they did um, in the uh, presidential election, which is to be expected in some respect, but I would argue that uh, the numbers are, you know, just one of the biggest losses in this 
70 years, I think. The biggest loss in 70 years. Things that Obama had promised was he was going to end the Bush tax cuts for the richest of Americans. But we found that there was a compromise and uh, he made a compromise that some feel that was done behind the back doors, it really pissed off a lot of um, progressive uh, liber so-called liberal Democrats. It is supposed to be a fight, but there wasn't a fight. They passed it. Um, Representative Rush Holtz of uh, New Jersey believes that one, well, he's one that believes that this bill shifts more will shift more of the cost of maintaining. I'm quoting him. Uh, he says the bill will shift more of the cost of maintaining our society on the backs of the middle income and lower income Americans. Um, what are your um, what is your views on this recently passed tax compromise where um, I've heard estimates that some of the richest of um, the small minority of Americans will be able to get back something like $140,000 per family per family and per we're getting enough to go out to uh, what Kmart and get a Chinese made DVD player and we're supposed to be happy right um, and your question is that uh, what, what I think of it? Or? Yeah. What? Well, you know, I, I think a lot of uh, back in the 90s, 80s and 90s, there were a lot of Republican, mainstream Republicans that would find this tax cut to be somewhat uh, dangerous for the United States. If you care about the United States in some ways, about its future and so forth, and its ability to um, service debt and so forth, uh, one would say that the tax cuts really undermine the, the country as a whole, although it's a federal government, uh, there's going to be a huge effect on the states themselves, uh, who might actually have to end up taxing and cutting services and so forth. So it's really not a tax cut for working class people. You and I are not going to in any way uh, benefit from this because we're going to pay in other ways, through service fees, through increases in uh, uh, co-payments uh, for insurance and so forth and so, so on, uh, higher uh, rates for um, subway and transportation, uh, energy costs are going to probably be taxed uh, by the states, higher costs of, uh, for education, uh, efforts to uh, destroy or erode union power, uh, cut pensions and so forth. So this is really a huge tobacco for most workers in this country. And um, so we could look at a federal level and say, well, you know, you get a TV set out of it. Uh, but then on the other hand, I think uh, what it does is it undermines the ability of the country and the states to collect revenue. Um, my view is that uh, in some respect, uh, if they're going to cut taxes and end the wars, because, you know, Obama has escalated the wars around the world, uh, in the U.S. Uh, presence in Afghanistan, certainly, and uh, other parts of that region, the Middle East, uh, that that would be one thing, you know, but uh, both uh, two, two factors have happened. He's cutting taxes, and, and he's proud of it, it seems so, and uh, we're, we have no policy really in place except for promises, empty promises that we've seen in the past. Uh, to uh, withdraw forces from uh, uh, around the world. Do you think that after this year, that is this extension on these tax cuts, that the Republicans, um, since it will be 2012, will just come around and say, well, let's make these tax cuts permanent? And how do you think that the president will be able to maneuver then? Do you think that he's been weakened by this compromise? Well, I was extremely, uh, let's put it, uh, the, the, I, I was extremely uh, taken aback by the, not just the ease of the president to uh, agree to the ex continuation of the tax cuts for the very wealthy in this country, mm -hmm. but also Congress seemed to have uh, given up fairly easily. I mean, there was uh, what, some 140 or 150 members of the House that uh, resisted the tax cuts or voted against them, but it seemed to be uh, a fait accompli. I, I think that 
uh, as a president, Obama will probably take his cues from Clinton uh, in his second term, actually his, the latter part of his first term into his second term, where um, he essentially followed the Republican majority uh, that emerged in 1994-95. Uh, I think we are going to see a replay of that. The question is how far they're going to go with respect to Republicans are going to go in terms of maybe they'll want even more tax cuts. I also fear that uh, many programs are going to be cut uh, that we've come to rely on. And you're talking about Social Security, um, Medicare? Uh, precisely. I mean, both the, that's the only area where really there's, I, mean, I think notwithstanding Social Security, uh, Medicare and Medicaid is what they've been saying uh, in the policy makers, policy makers in Washington have said uh, are areas of uh, cut tax. And of course, that's going to uh, have a tremendous I I impact on the state's abilities to uh, pay for essential services for poor people, working people, elderly people, and so forth. Um, yeah, that. And uh, with respect to Social Security, I think you're absolutely cor correct because they already uh, reduced the payroll taxes on Social Security as a budget uh, means to not to. to to resuscitate the economy. I mean, this whole thing seems absurd to the person who looks at the uh, maneuvers from outside the United States. Um, we had the worst recession, uh, of course, the Depression uh, in 2008 to the present, although now technically we're not in a recession, but for most people, they're suffering very seriously with unemployment. Uh, and uh, we've had the tax cuts in place. Um, what is necessary is to generate greater levels of revenue. And uh, to me, it seems absurd to think that by continuing the tax cuts, essentially the same policies that Bush inaugurated, uh, will in any way change the calculus uh, in uh, revenue. So I see an uh, effort to go after programs that uh, have been created in the 30s. I mean, we saw the beginning of it under Reagan, a very uh, effort to cut, increase uh, retirement ages for various, scaling them in different areas. So people, when they retire, they'll get less money. I think that we could potentially expect that to happen again. Do uh, you think that they will raise retirement age in the... I think they're going to try to, yes. In they America. just tried to in Spain and I think there will be an effort to. And Do you think that they will also go after uh, Obama um, health care reform, his health care program? I, I couldn't tell you really at this point. I think they have already tried to, uh, a number of Republicans have argued that it's unconstitutional, which is also absurd. I think there's a lot of other things that their mandates are not unconstitutional. Um, I think there might be an effort to do so, but uh, that. Uh, health care bill, it, it, even in its watered-down state, uh, does not really increase uh, spending in the long term, so I don't see how they could justifiably go after it. I think that's something that Obama will not allow to take place. I think that's what he's going to look at as one of his great achievements. So if when he runs in 2012, he'll say, well, you know, look what I gave you, health care, and at that point, healthcare reforms will have started to kick in to a larger extent. So that there might be a fight over that, I don't know. What do you feel about um, well, as you know, they're saying that we we have out of we are out of recession, but we're in some kind of jobless recovery. And recently there was a uh, front page item in the New York Times that a lot of the jobs that have been created are basically part time. Is this the way that we're going? Is, is it's yeah, like uh, it's yeah. like corporate America and the companies have reset um, themselves after this recession, and they're not going to um, offer jobs um, with benefits or full-time employment anymore. Mm -hmm. Do you think this is? Yeah, I, I think I think uh, we're going to see fewer jobs that carry health uh, benefits. Uh, we'll see how that relates to uh, the health care bill because that mandates employers to provide 
for people to buy their own health care. Um, I think that pensions are, are going to be eliminated for many people, private pensions and also public pensions. Uh, so I think that there is going to be an effort, especially amongst and private pensions really for the most part are gone in private industry. Uh, I think there's going to be an effort to balance budgets by reducing public pensions uh, to a significant uh, degree. Um, with respect to the low-wage jobs, uh, I think uh, this is a problem that we've, it's long-standing in the United States. You know, with a $7.25 minimum wage in this country, uh, I think even two incomes will not raise you above the poverty line. So, and the people, and employers aren't even willing to pay that. They, you know, they, they thrived under the Bush administration's uh, formative years uh, when uh, minimum wage was five dollars and fifteen cents for you know the longest period of time. The, uh, the the minimum wage did not go up in history since the the uh, New Deal. We see a lot of things happening around the world in Greece. Uh, we see students who are pissed off at their um, how how tuition costs uh, have raised have been raised in in um, the UK. Um, in fact, I saw some footage uh, of people throwing firebombs in Greece. Do you foresee any kind of political unrest uh, like we're seeing in Europe? eventually coming to America in the foreseeable future? When you say political unrest in, in Greece and, and the in students Europe, in England and Spain and Portugal and yeah. other places, Ireland, Ireland etc. Um, a lot of that is uh, unrest that's not really mobilized by major political forces, although in certain instances they have longer histories of protests against their states. Um, I, what I do see is those movements as being efforts to regain what I would call a, in others, maybe a new form of democracy, that, you know, elections are just uh, once every two or four years and so forth, that essentially they're expressing their discontent in the streets and politically and uh, without much uh, so far uh, efforts by governments to uh, reduce these draconian or end these draconian policies uh, that are imposed by the IMF or the European Union and so forth. So I, I think that those, you know, the, in, in Greece particularly there seems to be a, a tremendous movement that's continuing and has continued for the last several years. Uh, especially since the uh, 2008 or so, late 2008, I, I would, uh, I, I, I really couldn't say about the United States, uh, mm -hmm. except to say that I think that there's a need for a new form of uh, democracy that's expressed in the streets uh, rather than in uh, the halls of Congress. And I would consider that uh, to be a move in the direction of a uh, more participatory uh, government because people, you know, I, I really don't consider voting or not voting, most a lot of people will vote, a form of uh, genuine democracy once in a while for basically the lesser two evils. Mm -hmm. So one can only hope that people will express their, their democratic beliefs through mobilizing in different ways, through taking over factories, taking over schools. Uh, seizing control over them and running them when the, the factories closed down, for instance, um, and uh, resisting uh, in other contexts. But the United States is uh, it, th this history is really strong, uh, going back to the 1930s and 50s and 60s, particularly 60s and so forth. So I, I would say that it's a, the possibilities are there and. Uh, 
the seeds are being uh, planted at this point through these policies. I think a lot of people are fed up and don't know what to do. And the question is, for many uh, leftists, you know, is there any means to mobilize people? Yes, you know, if you read, if you see the way people uh, are engaged in various forms of activities throughout the world, uh, uh, resisting their bosses and so forth, uh, uh, building their own schools so that uh, when schools are taken away from them or reoccupying them. Uh, those are all forms of resistance, but there doesn't seem to be any kind of uniform uh, challenge uh, within specific states uh, to the status quo. We don't have an alternative to the neoliberal regime that's in place now that has been consolidated in any way yet. Time will tell to see whether that happens or not. If you live in the New York area, and I think that basically New York, um, because of uh, the bailouts, was practically left better off than the rest of the country. But if you're a New Yorker, and if you're a New Yorker, you, you look around and you say, ah, oh, things aren't that bad. But, um, I, and I've heard one person say that we're in a bubble. If you live in New York City, we're in a bubble. A bubble. The economic um, is a is a real economic disaster in other parts of the rest of the country. Do you believe that? Well, I think certain s classes in the city of New York are in a bubble, and uh, New York City has the highest level of inequality in the country as a whole, uh, based on 2009 data, and uh, the tax cuts are going to benefit uh, that that group of people and. Since there are so many uh, upper class people in New York City, uh, they are living in a bubble. But I, I see a lot of, I mean, right now we have more people who are homeless than we did uh, 20, 30 years ago at the height of the period of homelessness. Uh, maybe they're not seen on the streets, maybe they're in shelters, maybe they're doubled or tripled up in different apartments, but that homelessness is there. Uh, I think it's very easy to. Uh, say that if you are a member of the upper classes, I can, I'm repeating myself again, uh, that um, things are fine here, but um, I also think that there's a very great danger that a lot of the uh, problems in New York stem from the degree of inequality between rich and poor in the city, uh, the failure of um, the city's government, and I blame both the mayor and the city council for this, and the state, uh, and so forth, to develop a uh, middle income working class. Uh, we don't have one, it, and, and those people that are members of that middle income working class uh, are becoming fewer and fewer. And it's possible with budget cuts this year that those people are going to feel even more of that pain. It's not possible, but probable, I would say if those budget cuts go through, because we're going to feel them on the state level as opposed to the federal level. So that, having said that, I would say that I disagree with that perspective. I think New York City represents uh, a case of polarities between uh, the, the upper class and the uh, lower working class. Um, I guess you and I would consider ourselves maybe upper poor, something like that. <laughs> Working poor? I, I like upper <laughs> poor, you know, I mean, basically uh, surviving paycheck to paycheck. Yeah. But, but I don't think uh, people who are at Albany or at City Hall understand that. Thank you very much, Professor Emanuel Ness, for yeah. being on Ground, Ground Zero Television and sharing your time with us. Happy holidays. You're welcome. Happy New Year, and keep the struggle going. And start new ones.